We start with those bombshell Trump memos revealing how deep the team went on its fake electors plot. The New York Times obtaining memos dated as far back as November 18th, 2020, the earliest known effort to prepare these fake electors, showing the Trump campaign was attempting to buy more time to undo the results. The memo, written by a lawyer, stating there is a very strong argument that the real deadline is not December 8th nor even December 14th, but January 6th. The Times reporting Rudy Giuliani used the memos to strategize. They were initially meant to address the Wisconsin challenge, but became a part of the broader legal strategy. Trump lawyer Boris Epstein admitted last month on the beat there was a fake elector scheme. Since then, the feds revealed they are investigating it. In Congress, the January 6th committee closing in on the elector's plot, a committee member telling me Pence's aides are shedding light on the probe. Today, the Arizona GOP chair and her husband now suing to block the committee from getting their phone records. They are accused of signing documents falsely claiming to be presidential electors. And another memo disclosed today, obtained by The Washington Post, dated December 18th, 2020, and circulated amongst Trump allies, it suggested Trump should invoke the powers of the National Security Agency in an attempt to show foreign powers had meddled in the election to help Biden win. We are seeing bombshell report after bombshell report on this election stealing plan. And Trump is seemingly nervous, hosting more rallies, appearing on right wing television, trying to deflect blame. Trump saying both Pence and Pelosi should be investigated. Today, going at Pelosi again, saying, Capital security was Pelosi's job, not the president's. Why am I and those around me responsible for anything? Fact check, again, the House Speaker, not responsible for security on Capitol Hill. Joining me now, former RNC Chair Michael Steele and former federal prosecutor Barbara McQuaid. Michael, what is your top takeaway from these memos? Well, I, I think they give you an insight into the, the somewhat degree of panic that Trump uh, was uh, engaged in and trying to figure out, okay, how do I grab back this election? And when you when you sort of look at the timeline of events, they clearly were on a clock, December 14th being that first major clock, which they could not do anything about. Um, so then they projected to uh, to January 6th. I, I, I think, though, in the end, when I put it all together, if they had the means, Jan December 14th would have been the critical date because those states would have then certified the election under, those, under these... Um, under false premises, if you will. They would have in place the mechanisms to sort of cheat the system earlier in the process. That's what you see happening now, Alicia, with a lot of the changes in voting laws around the country, anticipating that that next time. Uh, but when you see it in the, in the overall scheme of things, it is very clear. Not only were the millions prepared to do what Trump wanted done, but D Donald Trump had his finger on that pulse. He was animating those actions. He was informing them directly of what he wanted. And from, from you know, Rudy Giuliani on down, they were prepared to carry out as much of that as they could if, in critical uh, times, they could get members inside the government, whether it's national security, Justice Department, on board to complete the mission. Michael, I got to ask you, Trump going after Pence and Pelosi yet again, what does that tell you? It, it tells me it's, it's the deflection. It's always the deflection. So when Trump when Trump goes after someone, stop and ask yourself, well, why are you going after them? Uh, you know, what have they done? What have they said? What are they doing that gets you so excited that you're going to take time to single them out? What it says to me is this is cutting very close to Trump. It, and it's putting him in a position where he realizes he doesn't have the power to stop it. He can't stop uh, the investigations in New York. So guess what? That, you know, those prosecutors are racist. He can't stop the January 6th commission. So what, what does he do? He threatens to throw people in jail uh, if you give him a chance to re-election and to disrupt the process by inferring or outright saying, I will pardon you if you are somehow caught up in this and convicted. Um, and so he's doing what he can, as he always does, to push the narrative back onto others, away from him, so that that becomes the story and not himself. Barbara, legally, how crucial are these memos as evidence? 
Oh, I think they're incredibly important, Alicia. You know, they're not the only story, of course, because what you still have to prove is knowledge and intent that this was a scheme to defraud. So if these were executed in good faith, thinking that this is a permissible way to contest an election, that can be a defense. I think the key witnesses in this to demonstrate that they knew it was false are, number one, Mike Pence, and maybe through his uh, chief of staff and other top aides, everybody can learn what Mike Pence knew without actually talking to Mike Pence. But to me, the other key witness is William Barr. William Barr resigned from the Justice Department in December in a very strange and surprising uh, timing. Ordinarily, an attorney general stays through the end of the term. He leaves in December, uh, right at the time all of these things were being discussed. And after he announced publicly that there was no widespread voter fraud. And so it seems to me uh, quite likely that he told that to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump did not want to believe that, instead pursued these themes. If so, and if they can prove that, then they have a very serious conspiracy charge here. The other point I want to make, Alicia, is one of these new memos talks about utilizing national security mm -hmm. as a basis for sec securing these voting machines. That is a breathtaking abuse of power. I worked in the national security area, and I know how many very careful checks are in place to prevent the abuse of power of national security because of the awesome might of that power. And the idea that you would just make it up and say, yeah, I think we think foreign countries are involved here, so we're just going to go on and seize those machines is, is a truly breathtaking abuse of power. Um, and, and if that happened, I, I really hope that the Justice Department is delving into this because it is so harmful to the credibility of our institutions. Absolutely. Michael, the New York Times reporting the second memo was dated December 9th, 2020. It set forth an analysis of how to legally authorize alternate electors in six key swing states, noting the scheme was unproblematic in Arizona and Wisconsin, slightly problematic in Michigan, somewhat dicey in Georgia and Pennsylvania, and very problematic in Nevada. Uh, that's a hell of a sliding scale, if you ask me. Where is the GOP reaction to all of this? <laughs> Where it always is. Nowhere to be found. <laughs> there, there's not a bank of microphones between here and uh, Timbuktu that you're going to find Republicans stand, stepping up to, to speak to okay, any well, of Okay, but let me ask you, if not on the fake electors piece of it, then as Barb was just laying it out, on the national security piece of this. Again, there's no incentive for them to do that. I mean, what are we waiting for? How much more evidence do you need? How much more do you need revealed before you decide, wow, you know, these guys really tried to overthrow the government? I mean, so look, I, I think in many respects, this comes back on the party in ways that we may not see right now. We'll leave that to voters to decide how they weigh that. I mean, whether they give the power back to uh, these folks uh, come November. But right now, the expectation has got to rest with, as Barbara rightly put it, with Merrick Garland, the Justice Department, and how they proceed with this. The January 6th committee is going to do what it's going to do, is going to put the evidence that it's been able to amass through interviews and documents, et cetera, in front of the nation, but more importantly, in front of DOJ. It is then going to be incumbent on them to decide exactly what to do. I'm not worried about, and neither should Americans be worried about what Republicans have to say, because they've said nothing up to now. So what are they going to say? What, what possibly could they say with Donald Trump looking over their shoulder? We just saw last week when, when uh, uh, Lindsey Graham comes out and, and says, well, I just think, that, you know, the idea of pardoning the January 6th, uh, you know, rioters is, is just unconscionable. We shouldn't do that. And literally within 24 hours, what happened? Got the smackdown. Backstroke. <laughs> he got the backstroke. Started doing the backstroke. You know, he got the smackdown. So, you're, so we know that scenario. The key thing, as Barbara rightly noted, is how DOJ is looking at this and whether or not on the other side there are criminal, potential criminal indictments to be pursued. Barb, what happens if the Trump lawyers don't talk to investigators? Well, I think that there will be assertions of Fifth Amendment privileges, and then there's a decision to be made about whether to uh, grant them immunity. Uh, they may also try to invoke attorney-client privilege, but, you know, there is a, an exception that when you're involved in a scheme of fraud or crime that that must yield. And so... I think ultimately that, that they may have to provide immunity, but that's a trade-off that prosecutors make all the time and maybe a trade-off that the committee ought to be thinking about, uh, you know, willing to give up some pawns to be able to capture the king.